left alone. And hey there, you walking dirt climb. Welcome and thanks for checking this link out. Are you wondering why I called you a walking dirt clod? Well, it's because we all are dirt clods. We were created from the dust and to the dust we will return. Our bodies are actually made up of the same compositional elements of the soil. Scientists know this and God's word does too. Genesis chapter 3, 19 says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for to dust you are, and to dust you will return. So, in a way, we are actually walking dirt clods, and definitely a work in progress. The soil condition of our heart is the main factor determining our life journey. Did you know that neuroscientists have discovered that the human body actually has three brains? We have the head brain, the gut brain, and also the heart brain. Each brain can learn, change, and communicate. The heart brain plays a huge role in what we think and feel, which leads to our decisions and actions. In other words, what we do. The heart brain, also known as the intrinsic cardiac nervous system, seems to be featured in the Bible often, and we are told to guard it. Proverbs chapter 4, 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now that was the New King James Version. Let's look at it in another one. This is the NIV. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The heart brain is your emotional center, and it definitely affects what your thoughts will be in your head brain and how you will feel in your gut brain. Now, the Hebrew word for heart is lev. It's strong number 3280, and reading from right to left consists of a lamed and a bet. The Hebraic thought of the word lev, most often translated heart, is also translated as inner man, the mind, the will, and of course the heart. It may have seemed silly to some, to attribute thinking and decisions and choices to the heart, but we now know that the ancient Hebraic insight into the heart is still accurate to this very day. There was no division between natural and supernatural, and in modern society we tend to only view the physical aspect and forget the spiritual. This is why when you read in your Bible the word heart, it carries so much more meaning than just a physical organ or an abstract meaning. The Bible has a lot to say about the heart. And Yeshua says that from it springs forth all kinds of nastiness. This is the Amplified Version of Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. This is Jesus speaking. For from within, that is, out of the heart of men, come base and malevolent thoughts and schemes, acts of sexual immorality, theft, murders, 
adulteries, acts of greed and covetousness, wickedness, deceit, unrestrained conduct, envy and jealousy, slander and profanity, arrogance and self-righteousness and foolishness for judgment. Wow, what a list. This tells us that all the rotten things we do, namely sin, comes from the heart. It is a heart issue. It is a soil issue. Does the soil of your heart have books? You know, the things that bug you and cause you to constantly ruminate and focus on negative. Is your soil acidic, attracting the green slime of moss and mold (laughs) due to the poisonous bitterness of resentment and jealousy and hatred towards yourself and others? Or is your heart soil dry and crumbly, really hard soil where the water of God's word just runs off and does not sink in? Proverbs 27:19. As in water, faith reflects faith. So a man's heart reveals the man. So, it is the heart condition that leads to the action that reveals the true nature of who a person really is. And it is all about the condition of our soil. Let's now examine the parable Yeshua spoke of concerning seeds and soil. It's found in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We are going to listen to the Matthew version read to us by Johnny Cash. This is Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Chapter 13. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Yeshua was asked by his disciples why he always spoke in parables. He responded with, The mysteries of the kingdom are given to you and not to them. And because they wrote it down, we have access to some deep things of God. But why not to the general public? Because treasures and mysteries are revealed to those in a relationship with God. And a relationship starts by listening from the heart. And the hard truth is, if you hear a spiritual principle, understand it, and then reject it, you are more accountable. Remember the parable of the talents found in Matthew 25 and Luke 19. The one who did nothing and was not fruitful, his talent was removed and given to the one with the most. Another reason Yeshua gave for speaking in parables is that the people's hearts were dull. But notice at the end of the parable that we just heard, 
Yeshua says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Meaning, the ability to understand the spiritual truth was available to those with ears to hear and a heart to understand. Let's listen to the interpretation of this parable. We're going to pick up right where we left off, verses 10 through 23. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Okay, let's examine the interpretation. Now, some have tried to make this all about evangelizing others and winning souls. It is not about that. It's about fruit. People are not fruit. Your actions are fruit. Now, the fruit of your actions may win souls to God's kingdom, but the 160-30 principle is about how fruitful you are and fruit equal godly behavior. This parable is also not an acceptance of a one-time salvation message where you pray Yeshua into your heart. Actually, the traditional salvation prayer that we have all been taught to pray is not in your Bible anywhere. Consider that the seeds of God's Word are constantly being sown into your heart. There is a lot of gardening going on, and some places may be doing well due to God's work in your life, while other areas are not due to a lack of action on your part, also known as obedience. The whole heart needs to have good soil. It's those other spots that can overtake the good soil and turn it bad. Let's recap the four types of soil Yeshua spoke about. Okay, the first heart soil was the hard soil. It doesn't understand what God's word is saying. The enemy quickly snatches it away, so 
So the person doesn't even think about what was just heard. This inability to understand can come from a refusal to accept what God's word actually says. There is nothing wrong with the seed. It's the person's attitude. The second heart soil was shallow. God's word is awesome and great until something bad happens. Persecution hits. Life doesn't go as expected. Your prayers weren't answered the way you wanted. Your faith is tested. And because you thought God's word promised you only blessings and good things, not the hard, rocky stuff, because you could not take the good with the bad, this plant withered away. Now, the third type of soil is divided, or we could even say cluttered, by life, which is represented by the thorns choking the plant. This person listened, accepted God's word, and actually grew. The problem is, it produced no fruit. You are worried about money, your job, family, personal concerns. The daily grind and focus of life are choking out your fruitfulness. You are too concerned about the things of this present life to focus on eternal and spiritual things and growth. And the last soil type in the parable is the good soil. You've listened to God's word and it sank in. You understand it. Now the first level would be knowledge where you're learn the God's word and then there's revelation where it comes alive to you and then wisdom is how to apply it and then you walk in it. We could say that getting all three is the 100% mark for fruit growth. The closer you get to God and his word and walk in it, the more you grow and produce fruit. Now, it's time to talk about fruit. Many of us believers have heard of the fruit of the Spirit, mentioned in the book of Galatians chapter 5. Often people will refer to it as fruits with an S at the end. It's not fruits of the Spirit, as in an apple equals love and a peach is joy, but rather think of it as a whole, like an orange, a tangerine, or a grapefruit, with nine segments forming the whole fruit. In Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. This is the fruit that the Holy Spirit will help you produce when your heart soil is good. Many often joke about not praying for patience as God will give you lots of trying circumstances to work on your patience. But the same is true for all of it. Pray for more love and watch for an opportunity to practice unconditional love towards a very unlovable person. Working on peace may look like surviving amidst chaos. Now often these will all meld together in a nice package designed to make us cry out to God for these fruits to manifest 
in our lives. If we work with God to pull out the weeds of unforgiveness and the thorns of distraction, remove the stones of heartache and disappointment, fill in the gouges of trauma and wet the soil of our hearts with God's living water, his word, in other words, do some serious gardening in our heart soil, we will grow in the ways of the kingdom and produce fruit, meaning our action will be Holy Spirit filled and bless God and others. Remember, nothing grows or changes without some form of struggle and hard work. A great list about how to prevent being unfruitful is found in Second Peter. Let's go look at that. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that this is really uh, a great list here. And it says, if they're yours and abound, meaning we're supposed to keep improving on these now with all this talk about fruit let's talk about being a fruit inspector being a fruit inspector is helpful in examining ourselves and others yeshua speaks about how a tree is known by its fruit. We're still listening to good old Johnny Cash. And now we're going to listen to Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Did you notice that Yeshua said it's the heart that produces the fruit. He also connects the things we say to our hearts. This passage about trees and fruit is also found in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to start at verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. There is a lot to unpack here. This tells us that fruit inspection is very important in identifying false prophets. This day and age, it's a bit harder to examine fruit because it is a hands-on and up-close personal job. It is much harder with the internet and TV to know what someone is, might be like offline or out of view of the camera. We can't see how people really are behaving. Unfortunately, there has been a whole lot of trickery and deception involving what appears to be on the surface, a wonderful ministry with the preaching of the word, saving of souls, healings, casting out demons, or even performing great miracles. But in the end, to some, Yeshua will say, I never knew you. Oh, by the way, anytime you see a word twice in the scriptures, like Lord, Lord, in the verses we just read, it just means shouting, kind of like we do when we text in all caps. So these people will be shouting in indignation and list all the wonderful things they did in the name of the Lord. How can it be possible to do all these amazing things for God and then have him say, I never knew you? It is because they had no fruit. Fruit is godly behavior brought on by obedience to God's word. It does matter about our relationship with him and how we treat others. People often do their own thing and go their own way. And then when bad things happen, they blame God. Proverbs 19.3 says, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, and yet their heart rages against the Lord. Remember, being a fruit inspector is to identify the fruit, not for judging. It's very important to remember that all of our own fruitfulness is only because of our walk and obedience to Yeshua, because without him, we can do nothing. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. This is Yeshua or Jesus speaking. God can really do some amazing things with our hearts. He can even give us a brand new one for the hard heart of stone. Let's see that. We find this in Ezekiel 3626. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God is not only a master potter, but he is also a master gardener. And he is the only one that can help us with our heart issues. When you are reading his word or listening to it, consider the following and ask yourself, did I really listen and understand it? Did I immediately disregard it 
or close my heart to it because I didn't like what I heard. As a side note, I'm not talking, I am talking about God's word as it stands. God's word as it stands all by itself, not someone's opinion or interpretation of it. Another question, do I have an area of a shallow soil system where this particular seed is wonderful and I believe it, I love it, but a hard time in this area could destroy my faith. What is my focus in life? Am I too wrapped up in earthly concerns? Like for example, I know God's word says, fill in the blank, but I'm too busy, I don't have the time, I've got too much going on, or it's just too hard. Let's close with one final verse. King David wrote this after he was found out about his affair where he committed adultery and then murder. It is never too late to ask for forgiveness and to cry out to God to help us with our hearts. We find this in Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Well, since YouTube has restrictions for sharing other people's material within a video, I will be putting a couple links for songs that have to do with God creating a new heart within us. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope it blessed you. May Abba Shammayim, our Heavenly Father, bless your heart and help you with all your heart gardening adventures.